faced by housing, food, water, daily needs, and the economic and financial crisis faced by them. Not only by the laborers, but also in the city, many of them were depending upon the multinational companies like Substaff, those who depend upon the MNCs for uh, a security personnel, drivers, sweepers, small restaurants, eat outs, water suppliers, mention any number, any of them. These millions of people were dep depending upon these uh, high middle class, high middle class, educated, software, youth, uh, for which, for whom they were servicing in some way or other. Then the most important one is the screen related problems, which will be discussed separately. The abuse and addiction. You take any family, most of them will be complaining about this internet addiction and internet abuse without any exception, very rarely the parents do not complain about it. So what are the resultant issues? Next. Impact is upon younger children, school and college going students a little bit different. Those with special needs, the underprivileged, the quarantined, separated and often that we will come later. Coming to the younger children, usually, the problems start, they have started. Even when the mothers were pregnant and these children were fetuses, because of the anxiety, no regular in person checkups with the logician, uh, COVID positive status, the expenditure, and majority of the women could not go back to their parents' house to have the confinement. The would be mothers were severely stressed and distressed. Definitely, this is likely to have an impact upon the psychological well-being of the developing fetus later. Of course, not everybody is going to be affected. If the mothers are affected, it can have some impact upon the growing children, which we have to recognize. The younger children, the clinginess, because they were always with the mother, there was no opportunity to be with them with other children or with uh, outside the house or caretakers. So all they know or knew were only the mothers. The fathers may be working also. They became restless if the mother was missing. Yes, even if she goes to the toilet or to take bath, these children cannot be away from them. Then the other group is separation anxiety. Once they start attending the school, all along for the past four years or five years, otherwise they would have gone to the play school. They were with the parents. And the separation anxiety will be noticed in a few children. Of course, it's likely to settle down. Irritability. Children do not know how to express their sadness or their issues, their psychological feelings. They manifest its irritability, tantrums when they are emotionally upset, upset because they don't have any other let out and no kids to pay with. They were almost cooped up in the house for 24 hours. So the tantrums are common. More so, disturbed sleep and nightmares when the parents are disturbed, when the family is disturbed and they were worrying, quarreling amongst themselves, marital issues and mothers crying due to various reasons. These children do react to it by disturbed sleep and nightmares, they, ca they cannot expect it in a, a, a express their feelings in any other way. So these symptoms, if they are present, we have to look out for problems in the family too. Among the school and college going, COVID has impacted almost 91% of the world's student population. I'm quoting the recent literature. Disruption in education, physical and social activities, learning to take up responsibilities had they gone to school. Now, they did not know how to look after themselves, be independent and help others. The parents or the grandparents were pampering them in the house, even feeding them, looking after all their needs. When suddenly they have to go back to the school, they may find it difficult. The absence of a structured regime, 
which the school was providing. Some of them have started avoiding homework during the online classes. When they have to go and start doing it again, they find it really difficult. But these are smaller problems which can be overcome with appropriate and adequate counseling to the children and parents. And worries about future, this is about the older ones, around 16, 17. They were preparing for the competitive exams like NEET and Fiji and uh, exchange programs. Higher education in under other countries, even for undergraduate courses, countries have closed their borders. So youngsters are caught in other countries sometimes. They would have gone for some exam and could not come back. These people face enormous anxiety about their future. And the depression and other emotional disorders, which can be seen, this is one thing I'm going to talk in a little bit detail later. It may be obvious clinically, I will tell you the signs, or it may be subclinical. Some of them would have been stressed, some of them are distressed, and they were anxiety and emotional outbursts. The anxiety may be manifesting as psychic anxiety or somatic symptoms. Some of them will internalize, will not come out. Some of them will externalize with aggressive behavior, irritability and low frustration tolerance. Because in children and adolescents, the anxiety and depression do not manifest as in the adults like anhedonia, lack of motivation, sadness. The symptoms can be different. And finally, the role of gadgets. They became dependent. There was abuse and addiction. In majority of the homes, this is a major problem between parents and children. When they were trying to channelize their energy in other things, try to reduce the online timing, usually they get into a lot of quarrels. Children become oppositional. They don't want the parents to interfere. Uh, this has changed the life upside down for many people. Major problems like internet gaming disorder and access to objectionable contents like the pornography were seen more in the boys. This has led to financial blackmail from others, children themselves blackmailing, cheating, using the parents' a debit and credit cards, lying to them on one side. And if they are, were viewing the objectionable content, they some of them started feeling guilty. They could not discuss their guilt feelings with the parents. Of course, some of them did tell the parents, those children who have high moral values and ethical standards were the most affected by guilt. Whereas in others, there was an increased sexual urge and an obsession to view the uh, blue films without which it was very difficult for them to sleep. They have to do that. It became an addiction and the vulnerability of abuse, especially in the females. A lot of the youngsters, teens, were taken for a ride. Unwanted, unreliable interpersonal relationships, running away from the house, eloping, taking away the money, stealing to give their boyfriends money to buy something who were cheating them are some examples one can talk on it for hours together then finally the mental health issues the emotional disorders like depression anxiety and oppositional deviant disorder children who were or obedient uh, following the rules and regulations of the house, became defiant, not responding to the parents, showing their uh, opposition either outwardly or in a passive way, blackmailing them, saying I will run away, I will kill myself or I will kill somebody, self-injurious behavior, slashing themselves, attempted and completed suicide. You would have read in the newspapers where youngsters have um, com committed suicide because the parents removed the mobile from them. They refused to charge them. Because the parents were strict, some of them committed murders, some of them committed suicide. The murders also you would have seen. 
and disturbed or altered sleep and eating pattern sleeping by 4 o'clock 3 o'clock in the early morning and waking up at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock missing their morning breakfast and meals snacking that name uh, said will be talking and there is a decreased motivation and interest in academic activities and fall in scholastic performance in a percentage of children children who are doing very well who were scoring high marks till 10th standard started going down in plus 1 and plus 2 and the motivation came down most of the time they were with the gadgets they are techno savvy they know how to use the gadgets and how to make the parents think that they are attending the classes online they will switch off the video camera they will switch off the mic and they will open up another uh, slot and they will be watching all those things or they will be discussing with other children when the parents they won't allow the parents to enter the room saying i am attending online classes don't come and disturb me so the parents believe that they were attending the classes and some of them did not do the homework because there was no one to check the homework and the abuse is physical emotional and sexual in the families physical especially in the lower socio economic strata where the father comes home uh, consuming alcohol or staying at home and consuming alcohol mother reacting to it in between the children are caught when both of them are irritated they were physically abused emotionally abused because of the problems marital issues and the other problems intra familial problems sexual abuse i need not tell some of the girls were abused by the family members themselves again you would have read all these things in the papers and then comes the children with special needs especially those with the autism spectrum disorders were the most affected of course we have to talk about the children with adhd cerebral palsy physical disabilities who could not attend the classes without the special aids which were available in the school so the asd children uh, had almost in all areas of development they had progression they were going to the therapy centers inclusive schools and special schools started showing a lot of improvement later during the past two years they could not attend any of these things the online ones were very few and they could not concentrate properly like the offline or in person ones the tantrums agitation aggression and the behavioral problems increase children who were never given drugs are to be given drugs to reduce this so that they can be sent back to the schools and therapy centers and the post pandemic impact upon the routine once they go back to the schools these special children they take a lot of time to settle down and they were used to a different kind of an environment for the past two years it's very difficult them for them to change the routine which has come up during the two years and some of them were refusing to go started creating problems in the therapy centers where they could not manage and they have to be sent back so that they settle down it is very difficult for the parents to make them settle down and this covid passed for the learning disabled children children who were in the elementary schools below fifth standard they were managing till third standard and during the pandemic there was not much academic pressure once they started going back to sixth standard the gap between their abilities and their performance came up and they could not manage so they started refusing to go to school parents were thinking these people were not motivated or not interested in going to school teachers did not know the problem and majority of them landed up with a lot of problems behavioral problems and we have to spend hours to find out the problem then the underprivileged worsening of the social inequality some of these children who were attending the private schools had to go back to government schools to which they were not used one teacher near neveli told me now she has 120 children in her class which is very difficult for us to manage and also those children were finding it very difficult uh, to be on par with the children who have been already attending 
we found it very difficult to adjust and adapt. Of course, the nutrition part, others will talk. Lack of online class, access to online classes because of the poverty, the child labor. Here, the parents, some of them who were private school teachers or college professors in private colleges, since these institutions closed down, they had to go for daily labor, 100 days uh, work offered by the government. Imagining a, imagine a PhD or a postgraduate uh, qualified parents going for this uh, 100-day work to earn a living. It itself is very difficult. It's more so in the lower socioeconomic data. The children were forced to go and earn. And the impact upon the street children who were depending upon the arms they were collecting, getting, and also the whatever they were rack picking children. They had some night shelters to stay. Even that was gone. There is a 50% increase in child line calls, 1098 calls. And the child marriages you would have come across. The parents, not knowing what to do, started getting their 15, 16, 17 year old girls married off to much older men. The quarantine separated and often, I have already talked about it. There was anxiety, depression, grief, prolonged grief, fear of death and abandonment. What will happen if my father, there was a child who kept the family photograph. He was he's around 11 years and he has to look at the photo continuously to make sure, tell himself that everybody is at home and they are alive. It's not an easy joke. It may appear very easy for us, but think of a child who has to constantly look at that photograph to remind himself. Discontinuation of studies, increased responsibilities. Post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm not going to talk about it because it's something that has to be dealt by the mental health care workers. The family dynamics, adjustment problems, marital issue, pro marital problems, drug abuse issues, that is totally different. So we are coming to the end of my lecture. What is the post-pandemic management? This is very, very important for the pediatricians because you are the one who is going to collaborate with the stakeholders, parents, children, teachers, student counselors, parent teachers, association members, and the NGOs, mental health workers. You have to work out strategies for, for promotion of well-being, prevention of problems, and intervention if problems are already existing. It's very difficult because majority of the people who are coming out of this problem to normalcy may not be aware of these issues. The general public may not be aware of the psychosocial uh, trauma, other issues faced by their teens and tweens. And even if they are aware, they may not accept because there is always a stigma attached to psychological well-being. Then comes the availability of services to contribute positively uh, to have an impact upon the well-being. The access, how you are going to approach this by reducing the stigma. Psychological problems are equal to physical problems. The physical pain and physical trauma can be seen Psychological pain and psychological trauma cannot be seen and this is, should not be equated with a mental illness which the lay persons consider is something uh, shameful. And the underscoring of the early intervention to prevent further deterioration in all areas of development as I have said, physically, emotionally, socially, behavior. The pediatrician role is paramount as a guide and coordinator to all the stakeholders. Of course, the role of mental health care professionals is different. And you can't ask the people to go to the psychiatrist or psychologist at the outset. If at all there is a need, the pediatricians have to talk to the parents, underscore the importance. Otherwise, the pediatrician himself can contact the uh, mental health uh, 
specialists to know what can be done from their level. Unless and otherwise, it's very important the pediatrician himself can manage to talk. Now, my last slide is the red flag cells. Majority of us, whether the parent or the parents especially, may not know what the child thinks or children think they feel or perceive during these periods of hardship. It's very difficult. Children may not come out, but their behavior shows the problems. So how are we going to see? If you see some of the undimensioned problems existing for more than two weeks and is noticeable obviously by everybody in the family, not only one, by one person, then it is something which should be looked at. In young children, it's clinginess, irritability, separation anxiety. Even if the mother is outside for an hour or so after telling, they create havoc in the family, create a, produce a lot of tantrums. They have disturbed sleep regularly, nightmares, and uh, suddenly start having encopresis, enuresis. That's of recent onset. Previously, they had bladder and bubble control. Lack of enthusiasm, looking sullen, sulking, withdrawn. They are not the happy children whom they were previously. In tweens and teens, it is mostly altered sleep patterns. Sleeping very late, not waking up early, becoming drowsy during the daytime, and insisting upon, upon sleeping with parents or hugging them. They were sleeping separately previously, they become so anxious, worried, that they want to be sure that the parents are with them. Either they may get affected or the parents may get affected. To tell themselves that they are safe, they wanted to sleep with the mothers and with the parents. And then the reduced or increased appetite, looking fatigued, multiple somatic complaints without any particular uh, condition, which can explain all those things. The investigations may be normal, especially headache, omitosia in the morning, and abdominal pain, body pain, some complaint or other. And remaining inside the room for hours together without coming out, not interacting with family and friends as before. Sometimes they become, they have low frustration tolerance. When the parents question about it, they shout at them, they become aggressive irritable or oppositional behavior, which were not seen previously, it goes beyond a limit. Some of them started expressing death wish. Some of them will be obviously crying, especially girls and mood swings. At one time they are okay, at another time they do not know what they are doing. They look anxious, worried, restless and have panic attacks. Decreased motivation and interest in previously enjoying at enjoyable activities lack of concentration, and decreased academic performance. These are the red flag signs. As my time limit is over, let me stop here. If there is any question, I'll answer in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And I think it was a very lucid presentation. Sari Ratra Maradal Riketavara, Sari Ratil Maradal Lili, madam. Now, we have a lot of people who are living in the world. It's very beautiful. Especially, I think you have uh, dealt in an elaborate way, just cross sectioning the long term effects, the short term effects, in the different scenarios how the children are affected, especially different age groups, different scenarios, and different types of children, especially the underprivileged, mental health issues, and especially the gadget users, adolescents. And overall, the final slide is speaks for itself. I think a pediatrician should... It. Yes, ma'am. I think the red flags, I think every pediatrician, if he, he keeps this in mind, I think he will pick out the children very easily and the remedy is there on the table or on the... It is easy for them to carry on. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll just look at it, ma'am. One... That Answer the end. Okay, somebody. We'll have it. We'll have it then and there, madam. So that uh, yes, it yes, easy. Okay. Ah, and uh, only one thing uh, I would like to ask, madam. Ipa vara vara na chena ipa moon voice, moon voice, naal voice kwan dengal ko da page speech dilay irke. Aam onde in the post COVID nariya paakra mar irke. Aduk oru mukhe lla onde na pati na ipa vara parents onde nariya bear onde na vitla na page na nikirangna 
ஆஹ் அவங்களுக்கு முதல்ல எடுத்த உடனே வந்து வீட்லயே இங்கிலீஷ் கத்துக் கொடுக்கணும் அப்படிங்கிற மாதிரி ஒரு டெண்டன்சி இருக்கு எல்லார்கிட்டயுமே இப்ப இன்னும் கொஞ்சம் அந்த கேட்ஜெட்ஸ் எல்லாம் வந்ததுக்கு அப்புறம் அதுதான் சொல்லி கொடுக்குற மாதிரி இருக்கு அதனால ஒரு விதமான ஒரு குழந்தைங்கள்ட்ட நிறைய பேர்ட்ட கன்ஃபியூஷன் இருக்கிற மாதிரி தெரியுது நீங்க எப்படி பாக்குறீங்களா நான் வந்து அதான் பேரண்ட்ஸ் சொல்றது ரெண்டு ஒண்ணு ரெண்டு பேரும் எம்ப்ளாய்டு ஒர்க்கிங் ஆன்லைன் பாத்துக்கிறாங்களோ வேண்டி பேசுறது இல்லை நம்ம ஊர்ல எல்லாம் வள வளன்னு பேசுவோம் இவங்க எல்லாம் எஸ் எம் எஸ் மாதிரி பேசிட்டு இருக்கிறாங்க ஐ ஆல்வேஸ் டெல் ஏபிசிடியோ ஒன் டூ த்ரீயோ பார்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் த பாடியோ ஏ ஃபர் ஆப்லோ ரைம்ஸோ பேச்சு கிடையாது எதா இருந்தாலும் நம்ம ஊர்ல பேசுற மாதிரி யாரு பெல் அடிக்கிறா ஐயோ இந்த நேரம் யாரும் வந்திருக்க மாட்டாங்களே அப்பா வந்திருக்கிறாங்களா போய் வெளியில பாப்போம் வாயே அப்பா தாண்டா அப்படின்னு ஒரு லைன்ல சொல்றத ஒரு அஞ்சாறு லைன்ல பேசுங்க பிகாஸ் தெர் இஸ் நோ படி டு டாக் டு தெம் நோ படி டு இன்டராக்ட் வித் தெம் அந்த ஸ்டிமுலேஷன் வந்து ஃபர்ஸ்ட் பியர் குரூப் அதுக்கப்புறம் ஓல்டர் அண்ட் எங்கர் செய்யும் அப்புறம் அதர்ஸ் இது வந்து சீட் அண்ட் சாயில் சீடு ஸ்ட்ராங்கா இருந்தா எங்க வேணாலும் முளைச்சிடும் பாராட்ட கூட முளைச்சிடும் சீடு வீக்கா இருக்கும் போது சாயில் நல்லா இருக்கும் ஸோ த பேரண்ட்ஸ் டூ நாட் ரியலைஸ் தே ப்ரொவைட் எவ்ரி திங் பட் நாட் த ஸ்டிமுலேட்டிவ் என்வரான்மெண்ட் விளையாட கொடுத்துட்டா போதும் பொம்மையை கொடுத்துட்டா போதும் டிவியை கொடுத்துட்டா போதும் கேஜெட்டை கொடுத்துட்டா போதும் the first thing they are gadget should not be given and they have to talk 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 idana avangal solli kudukkaru adha oru vishayathula solla madam adhaadu moonu vayasukku appra school la vandu english solli tharuvaanga veetla irukumbodhu nama enna pesuromo adhu yelba pesunga appdin solradhu sariya irukku nu nenikiren aamaga mother tongue danga first adhu danga adhu vayathil irundha bodhe ketirukom adukapra especially page late a varra kuzhandigalukku mother tongue is the must அடித்தளம் <laughs> they were thrown for it but for the covid they would have gone out interacted would have gone to the play school would have had people and other children to interact with adu illadanal there seems to be an increase na appa the as seen first solala but they come with delayed speech and delayed socialization let me put it like that speech language communication conversation is delayed socialization social interaction social reciprocity is delayed definitely the pathro but with the early intervention some of them have started showing improvement within a month thank you madam oh. we'll go to the next uh, topic uh, shall i introduce the yeah, speaker yeah. Please, please the next topic will be neurological concerns in children following covid by dr shivam kesavan who has finished his md in madurai medical college and uh, dm in pj chandigarh he is a consultant pediatric neurologist in meta hospitals over to dr shivam kesavan for this for his topic good evening sir thank you uh, greetings to all the senior uh, speakers and teachers in this forum uh, i thank the office bearers of iap tnsc for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, it's a very difficult task to follow on a presentation of this brilliance by someone as uh, diverse and uh, as experienced as professor jayanthri ma'am uh i have a forewarning to do this is going to be a short presentation because as ma'am would agree most of the issues which are apparently neurological stem from a psychological origin uh, post covid there are a very few disorders which are truly neurological in origin which i'd want to highlight in this presentation so my uh, talk is going to be on that um as an outline i'm just going to briefly talk about covid and the brain what we know about the pathophysiology and focus on two groups of disorders the first group which i put below the first line are tics febrile seizures and developmental delay these are peculiar to children and have seen have been noticed to have an apparent increase in the post covid era uh, i am not going to talk about autism spectrum symptoms as madam has uh, very rightly put and an impact on children with neuro disabilities because these two are uh, talks uh, which need uh, sufficient time to be given to them and
any connection problem with him being not able to hear dr shivam you are there some disruption in this connection dr shivam shivan is last connection I'll, i'll call him i'll call him sir yes sir yes sir i think just wait for the call Yeah, I think he's he's there. There. Uh, sorry for the this was a technical glitch sir i think are you able to yeah 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 right now sir i have shared my screen yes yes audible and visualized thank you uh, sorry for the glitch so the last group of disorders are those which are seen in children as well as adults but i'd like to throw some light on them because they are of much concern to parents mm-hmm. as well as pediatricians so covid as you all know is not a truly neurotropic virus but we all know that it enters through the nasal olfactory epithelium it uh, goes through the olfactory nerves into the brain and affects the brain and causes the neurological symptoms we know that the olfactory epithelium expresses these two receptors which in combination internalize the virus so these receptors are the ace2 inhibitors sorry ace2 receptors which we know another one called the tmprss2 so this is how the virus enters the brain and this beautiful picture shows that this is the entorhinal or the olfactory cortex which is shown as uh, bright by these arrows it shows that it enters uh, into the olfactory cortex and uh, causes inflammation these two dots which are seen as you can see these two dots are the olfactory nerves uh, which are seen below the entorhinal cortex which shows that the olfactory nerves are inflamed and swollen uh, which clearly shows that this virus does enter the brain but does not have an extensive effect on the brain only due to the viral effects so the pathophysiology may be due to direct viral effects or due to endothelial injury these two are operative in the acute phase when the child has covid symptoms but later on uh, as we know the post covid syndrome or the uh, syndrome which is seen after the infection gets over is due to an inflammatory process which can be uh just following the infection which is called parainfectious inflammation which leads to a host of symptoms listed here or it could be post infectious inflammation which follows few weeks after the onset uh of the disease which is called post infectious period which leads to something called long covid syndrome which i'll be detailing a little later so i would like to start with the conditions which are going to discuss febrile seizures so febrile seizures have been uh, noticed to have an apparent increase during this period while we would expect a decrease because of masking and social distancing and the school lockdowns probably the spread of respiratory viruses have come down we have seen the decrease in the opd visits for upper respiratory infections so it's very likely that febrile seizures also would have come down but the literature is conflicting on this there are a handful of papers uh, uh, listing the incidence of uh, febrile seizures during this era none from india the first one to come up was that from italy which had a very bad impact in the first wave of this pandemic uh, there there was a, a paper from italy rome um, uh, general hospital had noted threefold increase in admissions for pediatric febrile convulsions who stated that this could be an alternative way this virus presented not the classic respiratory symptoms in in infants but a larger study which was uh, published a little later in as much as 8854 pediatric subjects under age 5 years said that only in 0.5% of patients who tested positive febrile seizure was a manifestation which clearly shows that it is not a commonly diagnosed neurological presentation of covid we do not have indian data to you know uh, base our views on but my personal observation during this pandemic i had the opportunity to uh, uh, pay visit to a lot of children with febrile seizures i felt that there was a cohort which was atypical in age for the first seizure usually we have a one and a half year old child or a two year old child uh, something like one to two years is the age of onset of the first febrile seizure i had seen a group of children who had febrile seizures as early as 6 months or 8 months or as late as 4 years or 5 years it's still falls under the bracket but it's not a very common thing to have a first seizure at this age i also observed an atypical presentation that is multiple episodes three or four episodes per day 
for prolonged seizures, something like 15 or 20 minutes leading to management as status epilepticus without a family history, without another evident focus, you know, contributing for a co-infection with COVID PCR positive, with antibody negative and a self-limiting illness. Uh, this is not a published data. This is my personal observation, but I did feel that there was an increase, particularly during the third wave of this illness. Uh, when the Omicron variant was uh, uh, widely prevalent, that there was a slight increase in the uh, presentation of children with febrile seizures with all these atypicalities. But once a larger body of literature comes out, particularly from the West, we'll be able to uh, much better understand this. The second and most dramatic neurological presentation during this pandemic was that of tics, which I also had the personal experience of a, in a sudden increase in referrals for these abnormal movements. I think all pediatricians, practitioners would agree with me. So what are tics? These are sudden, rapid, abrupt, repetitive and non-rhythmic movements. It is preceded by a, something called an urge where there is an uncomfortable feeling that is relieved by carrying out the movement. And it can also be suppressed voluntarily for a brief period in children who are more than five years, who are very much verbal, who are cognizant of these symptoms. They can generally suppress it. And generally, it involves the head and upper body. It generally starts with very simple tics, such as blinking of the eyelids, like, such as throat clearing, sniffing, and all those very mild facial movements, which are initially not noticed by parents, and it has a waxing and waning course. Generally, it comes down, it starts in boys, it has a 4 is to 1 male-female prevalence and incidence, and it starts around 5 to 7 years. It is usually uh, transient, that is, it waxes and wanes and goes away in a year. And in some children, it can evolve into a syndrome called Tourette syndrome, where it, they, these children have, you know, progressive and severe tics, and they have a vaccine waning course, though they tend to, you know, uh, decrease, they have a decrease in frequency around the adolescent period. And then in adulthood, they still have another, another search. So this is what classic tics look like, uh, which is seen, which was seen in the post-COVID era. But in 2021, there was a marked increase in presentations of sudden and new onset of severe tics. Uh, to neurologists worldwide, which is observed in India as well, but we do not have literature to substantiate it. This was uh, associated with a large-scale viewing of videos on social media related to tics. Creating videos and en enacting tics and sharing was done by young adolescent females. And there was subsequent increase in the views of videos with the keywords hashtag tics and hashtag to it. This was called something uh, which newspapers and journalists called TikTok tics. And this is a news a channel article which I want to show. These are all not true tics. These are girls imitating tics because they found it to be cool. And they spread as rapidly as wildfire during few months in early 2021. So this is what I want to play for you very briefly. This girl is trying to get swapped for a COVID test, but her body is just not letting her. <laughs> Wait, do you want to just close your eyes? Sorry. Just close your eyes. <laughs> So this is a TikTok video of a girl who is enacting these tics, these very rapid movements, which are not able to, uh, she's not, uh, which she's not able to control. These are not truly tics, which resemble tics. And this, uh, this video was viewed a million and more than a million number of times. And this spread like uh, uh, very, very uh, rapidly among adolescents. And these are some other examples of these videos which were made. About their uncontrollable movements or tics is now a sub -genre. You can see these rapid head jerking movements which are reminiscent of tics. This girl is trying to get swapped content. No, that's over the past. Started having tics. One doctor even. So basically this also appeared subsequently in the medical literature as TikTok tics. These are prominent journals like the British Medical Journal and the Movement Disorder Clinical Practice Journal publishing articles on this. It led to many hypotheses. First, initially, we thought that it is a truly uh, uh, uncovering or unmasking of Tourette syndrome. Probably it could be a post-COVID movement disorder because we know that infections triggers movement disorder. We know of autoimmune encephalitis. We know of autoimmune movement disorders. So could it be autoimmune? Could it be unmasking of Tourette syndrome, which is believed to be a polygenic inheritance disorder? by pandemic related stress, or it could be purely functional. This was what people thought. As I told you, we know post encephalitic Parkinsonism and Sydenham Korea uh, are known post infectious autoimmune disorders. The first due to uh, the influenza H1N1 pandemic, which was seen in 1914 and 15. And the second still we commonly uh, less than previously, but still we commonly see post streptococcal infections leading to Sydenham Korea. We also know of the syndrome called PANDAS, which is now called PANS, which is uh, 
pediatric post streptococcal or autoimmune neuropsychiatric symptoms which people are uh, uh, debating as to the etiology of the condition whether it's truly autoimmune or it is is it uh, is it a genetic condition which has been unmasked by an infection this functional tick like behaviors is what we have finally concluded that these ticks belong to these are purely psychogenic and does not stem from a neurologic uh, abnormality so this is this is a uh, pathogenesis of this condition has been attributed to a mass sociogenic illness or or called a social contagion children or adolescent girls tend to gain peer support recognition and a sense of well being sense of belonging while sharing this when they share with friends they they feel that they belong to a peer group because they are isolated because of the pandemic and shutdown of school and colleges they felt they 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 had a tendency to uh, uh, seek a sense of belonging so this attention and support inadvertently reinforces and maintains the symptoms this is something reminiscent of a similar phenomenon which happened in the 14th and 17th centuries in europe which is called dancing mania or dancing plague or choreomania which as this picture depicts uh, shows groups of people dancing erratically in thousands adults and children danced until they collapsed from exhaustion and injuries and the possible hypothesis Uh, proposed by psychiatrists during uh, for this uh, uh, condition was severe stress due to poverty and famine by doing this dancing mania outside because previously uh, there were no social media so the people couldn't make videos probably doing this uh, out in the streets along with other people made them get relieved of stress to a certain extent and gave them a sense of belonging so this is what we have concluded that this is a social contagion this functional tick like behavior is what currently medical professionals tend to term this disease so these functional ticks how to differentiate them from typical tourette syndrome ticks as i told you the tourette syndrome ticks start in childhood whereas these functional tick like behaviors or ftlbs as they have come to be called starts in adolescence they are abrupt generally i told you ticks are very mild they wax and wane children you know do this for a couple of months parents tend to ignore and then once the child comes with a you know persisting symptom the parents only then take notice and bring to a neurologist but this is very abrupt and the initial type of ticks as you showed in the video are very complex generally tourette syndrome in boys present very simple motor ticks as i told you very uh, mild blinking or sniffing female predominance is seen in this as against male predominance in tick disorders and the most common ticks are large amplitude movements as seen in the video as against very mild facial movements in tourette syndrome the most common comorbidities as psychiatrists are well aware are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder certain learning disabilities and obsessive compulsive disorder with typical ticks of tourette syndrome whereas anxiety and depression are the usual comorbidities one has to screen for when children present adults is present with uh, these functional tick like behaviors the first line treatment drugs are effective in typical ticks along with behavioral therapy something known as exposure and response prevention whereas the drugs which are used uh, commonly for ticks are not at all helpful in those with functional tick behaviors all they need is to be psychoeducated to talk to the family to uncover what the reason behind the stress was and to emphasize on functional interventions and management of the antecedents what caused these ticks and what are the consequences how to break the cycle of being in reinforced so this is how we have to approach these ticks this is purely a functional problem so this is a pathophysiology which we need to understand uh, to understand the origin of these ticks there are some predisposing traits people have proposed that there are certain genetic factors and there are precipitating factors the one of the most important precipitating factor is the psychological uh, stresses including social isolation uh, isolation lack of schooling and not meeting friends along with other physical stressors this in addition to exposure to ticks and tick like behaviors because when the child is predisposed when he or she uh, has been exposed such tick like behaviors in social media they tend to do this and post it themselves on their social media accounts and gain some popularity and sense of belongingness so there is also a predisposing state to this which leads to this phenomenon this is most likely anxiety or depression as i told previously and once these ticks uh, uh, start they tend to have a reinforcement because they get a social reward they have a selection and because of that people tend to uh, do this again and again and this becomes pervasive 
So management, as I told you, it is functional. So psychoeducation about this is very important to the patient as well as the family. This explanation itself to the child who is in distress that it is not a neurological symptom or it is not a uh, something which has a psychopathology behind it uh, leads to dramatic resolution of symptoms. It is important to note, as I already told you, that these young people or adolescents show no response to the usual medications. I have a personal experience of prescribing all kinds of drugs for these functional tics. Ultimately, they resolved on their own after sending to a psychiatrist and a proper counseling. The third issue I want to highlight is developmental delay. We have seen that, uh, I think pediatricians would agree that we have seen uh, a slight increase in developmental delay and decrease in the cognitive performance scores of children, especially those born during the COVID pandemic, which leads to this very fundamental question, whether it is biological, that is, whether it is due to the direct or indirect effect of the virus as I had, uh, showed in the cartoons previously, or is it non-biological environmental changes during the pandemic? So this also appeared in JAMA Pediatrics very recently, one month back. They had very systematically studied the association of birth during the COVID pandemic with neurodevelopmental status at six months because this pandemic baby's cohort is very young now. We don't know the long-term effects. But they compared those children who were exposed to the virus in utero from the mother or not. So they found that birth during the pandemic, but not in utero exposure to maternal COVID infection was associated with differences in neurodevelopment. So they said that the children who were born in COVID after uh, the onset of the COVID pandemic fared uh, less better than the historical counterparts who were born before that. But that was not uh, significant. There was not a group significance between those who had inter in utero or a, uh, did not have did, did not have an in utero exposure. So probably COVID nineteen related stress should be considered as a, as a potential underlying mechanism. What are the stress? As Ma'am had very well portrayed, we have job loss, we have mass uh, loss of housing, we have an increase in you know mood symptoms, we have an increase in food insecurity, particularly among uh, the poor socioeconomic strata uh, population. So this. Uh, there is another set of un unpublished data. This is probably more recent. They had studied children uh, up to the age of two years who had born from the start of the pandemic. And in this graph, you can see that the average cognitive score of children was around this. So this is the mean and the two standard deviations, which can so show, which you can see that after 2019, end of 2019 started plummeting and has reached a lowest point or of around 78 compared to 100 in the pre-pandemic era. Uh, so this uh, indicated a 22 drop, 22 point drop in their average cognitive score, which is something similar to IQ. And people have, these uh, uh, authors have postulated that males and children with mothers with socioeconomic, low socioeconomic uh, status and educational attainment suffered greater losses. So they concluded that probably environmental changes, especially less parental availability as Ma'am had stressed, contributed to the decline, but this still is con uh, conjecture. So at the end of this, we know that the development of children has taken a toll and the cognitive scores of children who, particularly those who have de been deprived of physical school education, has uh, come down compared to uh, the past. So this is, again, not uh, uncommon. We can turn to the pages of history to see extremes of such deprivation as cause of intellectual disability or poor cognitive scores. We must have heard of Caspar Hauser syndrome which was described in Germany in the 19th century about a boy who was believed to have grown up in a darkened cell since his early childhood. He had severe sensory deprivation, lack of social contact, hence resulted in intellectual disability as well as short stature as a result of neglect. So this is extreme cases of neglect leading to a poor developmental status. This is a concept of synaptogenesis. Now we are, have gained the wisdom that you don't, if you use, don't use the synapses they get pruned, they get thrown away. So ultimately your brain uh, does not, you know, uh, uh, keep those synapses which are not used. So if there is no sensory stimulation to the child, as ma'am had again uh, emphasized, there is not going to be enough cognitive development. We also know this because we take, uh, we take up what our environment has taught us. So nurture is probably more important than nature. As ma'am has said, the seed has been sown. It just depends upon, you know, how you make the plant grow. You know, we know stories like Tarzan of the wild kid who uh, has feral qualities because he had his environment was full of animals. And we know of a very own Indian Mowgli uh, who in Jungle Book demonstrates much of the feral kid characteristics. This is a concept of synaptic pruning, which I briefly mentioned. 
So this is a synapse where it is less active. This yellow thing is the more active synapse. And if you see that with time, the synapses which are not used just get through. They, they just get cut off. And those synapses which are used only continue to have the neurotransmission intact. So this is called synaptic pruning. If you don't use it, then you lose it. This is again a CT in a very extreme case. You can see that a normal three-year-old child's brain is full of gyrae and sulci. The ventricles are normally sized, but in, in this extreme neglect, you can see that the sulci are widened, which means there is cortical atrophy. And this is the ex vacuo dilation, which we say that ventricles have enlarged because there is a loss of brain matter. It means that severe neglect or sensory deprivation leads to a very severe decline in cognitive neurodevelopment. The fourth thing I want to discuss very briefly are seizures and epilepsy. Some people have observed, particularly parents have observed that during the lockdown period, there is an increase in the number of seizures and some pediatricians have raised this query that there is an increase in new onset seizures in patients who never had uh, seizures previously. So these are the very classic uh, uh, triggers of a seizure in a child with or without you know, epilepsy, fever, you know. Uh, sleep deprivation in many epilepsies, flickering lights and patterns in certain epilepsies called photosensitive epilepsies. Stress is a very important factor, particularly in adolescent girls with a form of epilepsy called idiopathic or generalized epilepsy. There is a non-compliance to drugs that is seen in all age groups and certain drugs including alcohol and menstruation in certain females. Now we have added one more to the list which is in hot contention. Uh, do mobile phones the electromagnetic radio frequency radiation emitted by them increases the risk of uh, seizures and epilepsy. Many parents have told that he never, my child never used mobile phones previously. Seizures were well under well good control. Now that he's at home, he's sitting with the phone all the time, be it for classes or for you know non-academic work, he's at, with his phone. So probably this could have lead uh, led to. This is not just one parent complaining. Many parents seem to have this hypothesis. But sadly, literature does not have enough evidence yet. Animal studies though show that. You know, the electromagnetic radiation may be harmful, but EEG-based studies show that electrical activity is altered, but that does not translate to changes in uh, the clinical status of the child, that is child the child having more seizures or new onset of epilepsy. So there is no good evidence, but still indirectly they may have an evidence. That's why I showed the common risk factors for seizure exacerbation effect on sleep. We know that there is a profound effect on melatonin secretion, use of mobile phones after uh, the evening hours. And that generally trigger seizures in many kind of sleep activated seizures or certain epilepsy syndromes and stress is increased there is now it is a known fact that gadget use has been increased to the levels of stress in children and that can lead to this uh, increase in the number of seizures and photosensitive epilepsy though seen in a very small number of patients uh, is a specific syndrome in itself where we give a specific warning to patients or and parents not to engage the child in activities where there is uh, more use of uh, flash your frickly flickering uh, screens. So this is one study where they had studied the electromagnetic field and EEG spiking rate. You can see that patients were given real 45-minute uh, mobile exposure and 45-minute sham exposure. And they counted the number of spikes in the EEG along with other measures. So they said that spiking activity tended to be lower under real rather than sham exposure. And there was no clinical increase in the number of seizures over a long time period. So still, we do not have evidence to this claim that mobile phones increases, uh, consumption of mobile phones increases the uh, number of seizures, but still we don't know. Headaches, yes, headaches have increased. They can be isolated or a part of post-COVID syndrome or the long COVID syndrome as we call that. But again, in children, we have very scarce reports. The long or post-COVID syndrome, which I'll be detailing in the next few slides, consists of a vague cluster of symptoms, including memory impairment, insomnia, fatigue, dizziness, and mood symptoms. Other than that, you can have isolated post-COVID headaches. So this has been very peculiarly noticed after COVID. And I also have a personal experience of coming across many children with new onset migraine-like headaches or worsening of migraine. The intermittency of classical of migraine becomes chronified. The child starts to have chronic or daily headaches or the headache which was seen in COVID during the acute symptom uh, symptomatology phase prolongs and the child continues to have COVID symptoms. So we know that COVID is a virus which infects the nerves. We know that the first nerve or the olfactory nerve is infected. Similarly, people have hypothesized 
that the trigeminal nerves have been infected. One prominent theory for migraine is the vasospasm theory. So uh, this is called the trigeminovascular theory, where increased stimulation of the trigeminal nerve through the efferents causes vasospasm and vasodilation, and that leads to COVID. So this, there is a biological plausibility that COVID triggers migraines and is also seen, but it remains to be proved. This long COVID syndrome, again, the literature is scarce. We have uh, papers who are, uh, where authors are reporting one to three months follow up around 50%, up to 50%. Some studies say as low as 2 to 10%, but we have evidence that post-COVID syndrome is a real entity in children. So as I told you, the symptoms are vague. There is fatigue, there is loss of taste or smell, there's persistent loss of taste and smell, headache, generalized muscle weakness and muscle pain. It's more commonly seen in older children because they are verbal, they are able to express. Probably it is as common in younger children as well. And it is not related to the severity of illness is important. The children generally have mild COVID and this itself can trigger the long COVID syndrome. The good news is that most of these symptoms resolve in one to six months. Adults, a small group of adults have a very bad experience with long COVID syndrome, having more respiratory and even cardiac symptoms leading to fatigability, easy fatigability. But children, in the contrary, with the small number of patient, uh, reports which we have in literature, tend to have a good prognosis. So this is a timeline which I wanted to show. Generally, these post-COVID symptoms are multi-systemic. Sorry to interrupt, not... Shivan. Last two minutes. Yes, sir. I'm finished. I'm finished. So this is basically seen in uh, adults, but in children, we have a very mild and a very short-lasting variant. And we have found that the pathogenesis of this is probably due to uh, an inflammatory pathology during the acute phase because there is a cytokine storm and the, and the post-cytokine storm, there is... Uh, affliction of multiple organ systems which has led to this uh, particular syndrome. There is a huge and a very significant and a treatable component of psychological isolation also in the pathogenesis of post-COVID syndrome because most of the symptoms uh, are have a psychological underpinning leading to because of social isolation and uh, a disruption in their daily livelihood. So you can see that tiredness and headache along with uh, the loss of taste or smell are the most common post-COVID symptoms, as common as in adults, children also tend to experience. The last slide is on anosmia. So this is a very peculiar symptom in adults, and we have come to recognize that children also tend to have this. At diagnosis, it is said that up to 80%, 75 to 80% have. And as days go by, at discharge, probably 10%, and then follow up only 5%. And children have a good prognosis. Children tend to regain the senses in a few weeks. Adults, un, uh, very unsatisfactorily, 1 in 10 have prolonged, that is even up to a year, they have a very permanent loss of anosmia. In children, it is very difficult to elicit, but you should remember that if post-COVID, a child has very bad avoidance of food and has an aversion and rep repetitive, you know, spitting out of food and poor oral intake, if you are excluded other causes, this has to be suspected and treated. And older children only can be satisfactorily treated by olfactory retraining. Generally, this it resolves on its own, so it has a good prognosis. So this is a summary. As I told you, the headaches, fatigue, anosmia, and AQC are probably the most common post-COVID okay. symptoms. As I told you, many of the neurological symptoms have a psychological underpinning, so you will have to look around the environment, what has changed in the child's day-to-day -day routine. Okay. This surge in tick-like behaviors is very commonly seen, but it has a very good prognosis that is, it is functional. And this developmental delay, lower cognitive function, and as Madam has said, the increase in autistic spectrum symptoms has stemmed from a lack of school attendance and social interaction. And the treatment primarily is not pharmacologic, it is neurorehabilitation behavioral interventions. Thanks for the opportunity. It was an excellent presentation, Dr. Shivan Keswan. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, you have dealt the whole gamut of problems of neuro neurological concerns post-COVID. Wonderful, all the febrile seizures increasing, ticks, developmental delay seizures, headaches, headache, long COVID, and all those. Uh, and of course, you uh, stressed on the synaptogenesis. And uh, you rightly said the stimulation and social interaction for children is very important for all the effects post-COVID and uh, hereafter for the parents. So uh, let us go to the next speaker, over to Dr. Ismail. Thank you, Dr. Sandel. I think I'll introduce the next speaker. Uh, she's going to speak on the school issues post lockdown. Uh, Madam Dr. V. Nagalata, uh, she's a medical officer attached to the SBOA school and junior college. And she, she's a student of Madras Medical College. And of course, uh, she's been interested in uh, basically teaching adolescents 
and uh, areas of interest is health education and adolescent counseling madam over to you ma'am and she is the better sir. half of our vice president yes yes that's more important <laughs> i think our vice president annabale vijay sagar is a better half thank you sir thank you dr ismail sir yes good morning to everybody rather good afternoon everybody uh, i take this opportunity to ta- thank the chairperson dr ismail sir and dr sendil sir i thank the iap tamil nadu state chapter president dr ramesh babu sir honorary secretary general dr rajendran sir treasurer dr gopal sir past president dr ismail sir president elect dr suresh balan sir vice president dr anamla vijayaraghavan sir joint secretary dr balasubramanian sir editor dr dakshayani convener convener dr tangvelu sir i must thank dr Kan- tangvelu sir because he has been a mentor friend philosopher and guide for our family and one more thing about him is whenever there is a crisis in the school when i have some doubts either i call my husband or the next on call is always dr tangvelu and he always answers me and he just says what i should i am expected to do and in a very nice way so that i can manage with the children also and i work for sboy school as you have said sir it has a strength of around 10000 children with this i will talk about the topic that is the scope of the talk is the impact of lockdown on school children teachers perspective problems from the student side and school doctors perception so madam, let me can you go to the full screen madam can you go to the full screen okay sir thank you sir i need my husband's help for all that sir oh <laughs> sir is there <laughs> yes sir he is there by the side is that full screen sir is it oh, not, yet. not yet not yet and the no, 90, only, yeah. and the 96th no one keela theriyudha paarenga madam adukku pakkathula irukiradha panninga na that will open in the slide show adu pinnal or cup paar yeah that side right. ah that's it okay even now sir no is earlier that- double click pannunga sir slide mele double click panna kuda varum now sir illa murali murali kooptukunga murali oda appa dhaan sir panniterukkaru பரவாயில்ல <laughs> <laughs> those aged between 10 to 19 years make up to 16% of the world's population and that is what the unicef says since january 2020 various countries started implementing regional and national containment measures of lockdown first lockdown was implemented on march 24 2020 in this backdrop one of the principal measures to, taken during lockdown has been closure of schools educational institutes and activity areas now let's go to the teachers perspective this pandemic not only affected the student affected the students it was very much reflected on the teachers as well many teachers had the problems of anxiety depression sleep disturbances and stress teachers when they were doing classroom classes they had to explain a concept and when they when the students understood the concepts they could understand it by seeing the students face and the eyes because there was a big sparkle in their in the students eyes this aspect was missing for the teachers during online classes many of the students were attending 
for the sake of attendance and didn't pay much attention to the online classes in the beginning. That was not true for every child. Some students really excelled in many aspects and surpassed their teachers also during online classes. The, it was a big jugglery for the teachers because they had to balance a lot of things. And it was not very easy for the teachers also to switch on to online classes easily because they found it very difficult to be online for hours together due to connectivity problems, net connectivity problems and recharging problems. Students at home were being less atten attentive in the beginning and they had to be coaxed with a lot of patience from the teacher's side. For some children, the parents also attended the online classes and they were very anxious about the child understanding the, what the teacher had meant. And in fact, the parents were asking a lot of questions regarding the subject. And this is how the online classes were. Lot many students they had to handle and it was very difficult for the teachers. Once lockdown was lifted, many children were not ready to attend the classes because they had to sit in the classes for long hours. Teachers once again found it very difficult to grab every child's attention during classroom classes also because they had lost the touch. Both teachers and students found it very difficult to wear masks for long hours together. Most of the teachers complained to me of headaches. And the teachers said the students were not able to sit properly in the classrooms because for two years they have been sitting on the sofa couches and they were lying down and listening to the online classes. Now they found it difficult to sit properly in a classroom for us together. They, they said the children lack discipline, basic etiquettes and manners. Kindergarten children, primary and middle school children had to be counseled a lot for coming back to schools. One teacher told me that uh, it was her experience. A seven standard kid hugged her and kissed her like a primary kid when she complimented him for his good work. She said the children haven't grown up or matured enough. They were not matured enough. And uh, those two years, it was just gone off for them. They, they, they haven't grown those two years. That's what the teacher told me. One more thing is most of the children were clever enough to know that they will be anyway getting promoted to the next class and they they just did not want to put their 100% effort. Now, after two months, the rapport is slowly building up and the teachers are confident. And they are hopeful that the children will come back to normal streamline. So this is how a general classroom looks like. Now we will come to the student's point of view. After two long years of lockdown, students found it difficult to be punctual to school. For online classes, students generally switch on the phone or their laptop or their systems and give their attendance and go for a break. Since it is not possible in a classroom, they become very restless. They felt that their freedom is being encroached upon. They most of the children said they wanted more breaks from masks and classrooms. Now that the physical education department is being opened up by the policymakers, they're very happy to go out and play with the children and expend their energy. There were also some economically backward children who could not afford for net connection and hence they try to drop out from school to help their parents. 
but these children were identified by the teachers and were helped by them. In fact, a few students, co-students also helped them out in the hour of their need. There was a lot of camaraderie among these children. The adverse effects faced by the children is, I think Jayanthini Madam had told quite a lot. I, I'm just telling a very few things. She, she managed to cover up everything, but I'm not going to do that. The, the complaints which I got, I'm going to tell. The adverse things was, they were- um, Pardon me, your slides are many... not moving. Pardon, sir? You are changing the slides or you are keeping the same slides, madam? Your I slides changed. are not moving, actually. Oh. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now it has moved, sir? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. So there were um, a lot of adverse effects also because there was a lot of room for unwanted things that the children got carried away and they, they were glued to the online devices mostly and became addicted to video games also and fared poorly in their academics. Constant viewing of the mobile system for long hours forced most children to develop eye strain, headache, and visual problems, which needed correction. I think the others will <clears throat> talk about it in a more uh, elaborate way. During lockdown, many of these school children were missing their friends and were frustrated. Some were depressed and feeling very lonely. They were lacking in socializing and many kids thought that socializing was not very normal. The good thoughts that blossomed after this lockdown was in adolescence, they were, uh, uh, they got both the bad and good things. The good thing is that high achievers excelled in whatever they did and had plenty of time to help other friends also. They were being connected with friends and helping them made a mountain of difference in their attitude. And uh, I'd like to add a little bit about the parents also. There were two views about it. Some parents thought that since the schools are reopened, the children will be taking care, taken care of and they can be peaceful at their work. But some, pe some parents were really apprehensive that the child would be exposed to the risk of infection and the children were not following the appropriate preventive measures like social distancing, wearing of masks and hand hygiene. So they were a bit scared about sending them to school. Now we will talk about the medical officer's perspective. The general fear among the students is they are disturbed even for very small ailments like cold, body ache, cough, et cetera. And they, they, when they get it, they immediately relate themselves like uh, many things were shown on the TV. They immediately think that they have COVID-19 and they have, they'll be admitted in ICU with a ventilator on. All, that, all those things get inside their minds. And we, we had to give them a lot of reassurance and counseling. Even for small things, they said, let's go. I, I just want to go home, ma'am. That's, that's what they always say. The unwanted issues about the lockdown was many students became lazy. They were all the time watching TV or eating unhealthy snacks and ended up becoming <coughs> overweight and obese since there was very little physical activity. So proper dieting and physical activity was advised and encouraged. And many children were pampered at home. Like in fact, the eighth standard child came with me for fever and I had to give him a paracetamol tablet. Guess what he asked me, ma'am, can you just powder it and mix it with honey and give it to me in a spoon? So I never expected this from an eighth standard child. So I had to tell him how to swallow a tablet. So the pampering was too much at home. So uh, the uh, wish of the students, I should say, and the teachers is that many of them hate to wear masks 
and they want to share their lunch or snacks with their friends during the breaks. However much we restrain them and advise them on social distancing, mask wearing and hand washing, it is so difficult to make them heed to our players. One good thing is that every child try to help the other child whenever somebody falls sick. In the pretext of helping the sick person, at least six to 10 people would come to my room. So even in the adversities, children take advantage. It was really fun to see them doing all these small, small mischiefs. We are hopeful that now students have come back to the normal streamline in a matter of time and they will be back to normalcy very soon. I just want to take a uh, note about physically challenged children and their enthusiasm. The physically challenged children are doing very well after lockdown since they have missed their friends. They missed all the fun. Like we have a child prodigy with a neurogenic bladder who had transformed this lockdown as her asset and won a lot of laurels to the school in the fields of chess and wildlife quiz. In fact, she is the world number one coder at this tender age. We have at, at least 10 juvenile diabetics who are cheer, cheerful to interact with peer groups. Thanks a lot for the help and guidance given by the endocrinologists. What COVID-19 pandemic has taught is we as medical fraternity and the teachers feel that we are all dealing with our own kids, empathize with them and take part in their daily activities. This is a real life calamity for children in, in spite of all the setbacks and personal lessons, personal losses, the school children have emerged out of the shackles come successfully and vigorously like a pearl coming out of the shell. This pandemic has prepared them for their real life. With this note, I thank one and all. Thank you and for giving me this sort of opportunity. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. That was really a wonderful lecture. I think uh, uh, having listened to you, the different perspective problems from the point of view of the teachers, parents, and the students, I am reminded of uh, one movie from Bakira, Jindru Poy Naleva. They used to say, Ek gaum mein, ek kisan ragutata. From similarly, all the children that have been trained like that to uh, attend the online classes, eating, uh, snacking, everything, they do it and they don't want to school right now, or don't want to go to the school. One young patient of mine said to me that uh, it is very boring in the school, uncle. I think it is very easy. My, my grandma will used to feed me. I used to eat French fries and uh, listen to the online classes. Nowadays, I, it's getting bored to go to the school. Such is the effect uh, it has been created in the children. Of course, you have clearly dealt what are all the problems and where we need to focus and how to rectify. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful lecture, madam. One and more uh, query, uh, uh, Dr. Smile. One, one minute. Yeah. Madam, I would uh, just like to ask you, uh, like, uh, uh, how did the uh, adolescents fare up in their career choices? How did they tackle the situation? Of course, the children and adolescents have, are uh, resilient and they have come back stronger after the COVID. That is one phenomenon which, is, which we are seeing. So the resilience factor is there, definitely. But how did the adolescents cope up with the career choices? The, the, uh, there are two answers for it, sir. Some yeah. children are so much focus, focused and they have done such a lot of homework of what they have to do later on and they come out with brilliant answers. They have such a lot of uh, wide uh, opportunities. That's what they say. Some children are really bogged down. They don't understand what is happening. Most of them. Like uh, it is, um, you can say 60, 40% has emerged out so well. They, they have learned so much and the 60% really don't know what to do. And they say their learning capacity has gone down and their listening capacity has gone down and they have to uh, overcome all okay. those issues. That's what they say. They yes, madam. Thank with that. They come out with Yes, that. madam. Thank you so much because Thank you, uh, as you said, uh, in private schools, they uh, cont contribute about 20 to 30 percent of the schools. But say 60 to 70 percent, they didn't even have the online classes. And yes. they, we, there, we had so much of school dropouts. 
and they didn't get the enough education what is required for them and they were the ones who really suffered uh, in this career choices and all those things that we have to uh, probably they will come up in life later when they finish their college days and uh, uh, doctor yes madam please no e- even in the uh, uh, um, uh, underprivileged children as we say they also have a lot more views uh, than we think like i i asked a few children outside like not the city children the village children but they also have their views they they are, they are really really competent and they can uh, they are very confident some of them not everybody but some of them are very confident of what they should do they know where they stand and they are really good sir thank you madam uh, dr ismail can you introduce dr sandra i don't have or otherwise i'll do it yeah you'll do it you'll do it okay uh, next uh, i mean the next two topics are very very important all the i request all the participants to stay back because it's going to be a two wonderful talks uh, which is which are new to us the, the digital eye strain by the ophthalmologist from coimbatore she is from arvind eye hospital a uh, wonderful speaker over to dr sandra ganesh for her talk um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and i thank uh, tangavelu sir and rajendran sir who are for giving me this uh, uh, invitation and also all the panelists on stage and i uh, have been listening to very talks uh, today evening and it has been a very interesting experience for me to be a part of this uh, august gathering so uh, till now we have been hearing about uh, the pediatrician's point of view so i think now it's a little bit of change uh, to an ophthalmologist point of view and but this is also a very important uh, aspect of uh, what we have been witnessing over the past 2 uh, to 3 years with regard to digital eye strain and its associated factors uh, mainly affecting children during this covid-19 pandemic this pandemic has been unprecedented in its history and the way we have been living our lives for the past 2 years is also very different from what was happening before so uh, what we have seen is that the educational institutions who have been closed since the march of 2019 to halt the spread of the covid-19 virus so uh, how to continue the education in this period so the traditional teaching method of using the blackboards and attending the uh, physical schools were changed to digital device assisted online classes it was a very good thing because otherwise the children wouldn't have been able to attend uh, school for a period of almost 2 years so those who ever had access to these devices could continue with their education but this had led to a restriction in the children and adolescents from doing their normal daily activities like playing outdoors and going to school they spent all their time in front of the digital devices inside dark and rooms attending classes and even beyond classes they started getting addicted to these devices and with its varied physical effects that we have been listening to to the, in the evening so uh, there was this uh, problem of spending a long uh, duration indoors and uh, that led to boredom and the parents also were working online uh, many times and uh, uh, without maids they cannot engage their children personally and it was difficult for them to keep a tab on the children uh, irrespective of their age group and the mandatory gadget use for the classes and educational activities was uh, encouraged and uh, also the attractions and distractions with normality presented every moment in the gadgets and very few people had access to large screen projections including smart TVs uh, where the online classes could be projected at home wherever it was possible we advised the uh, parents to do so because it reduced the eye strain tremendously so uh, there has been a sharp increase in our screen time because of the virtual education the online entertainment gaming video chatting with the friends and family so even beyond the class hours the class notes are also circulated uh, the homework is given through whatsapp groups or email so and an average for a minimum we uh, notice children spending an average of about 4 to 6 hours on these devices every day and this is without counting the uh, non education uh, time of digital uh, device use among the children so in a study published in the there has been various publications in the past 2 years in our eye health journals and i would I'm 
I'm sure similarly uh, would be uh, seen in uh, pediatric journals also. So there was this publication on the prevalence and the risk factor assessment of digitalized train among the children who are using these online devices during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was found that the main duration of the digital device used in the COVID era was around four years, uh, four hours, whereas in the pre-COVID era, it is uh, only about two hours. And 40% of the children were using digital devices for more than five hours in the COVID era, which was only around 2% uh, before the COVID era for education purpose. The most common digital devices which they used were only smartphones because it was most uh, easily available and they were well affordable by majority of the population. And around 40% of them used the digital devices held very close to the eyes. And mainly it is the distance between from the eye to the device which was causing all the ophthalmic side effects that we are going to see now. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the prevalence of the digital eye strain caused because of dry eyes. So the blink rate reduces tremendously when we keep seeing these devices, especially if the ambient lighting is very poor and if the uh, screen is very bright and uh, uh, we are seeing something very interesting then we tend to blink very less and that over a period of time can lead to dry eyes. So dry eye in turn leads to itching, foreign body sensation and uh, watering, blurring of vision and asthenopia and headaches. So uh, again in a study which was published in the Asian Journal of Research and Reports on Ophthalmology which came out in 2021, uh, around 25 to 93 percent of uh, uh, students uh, had uh, digital eye strain and majority of them had redness, watery, heaviness or grittiness, foreign body sensations, followed by eye pain and blurred vision and very rarely it can even cause a squinting of the eyes. So the digital eye strain uh, can be either ocular surface disorders or the dry eyes that I uh, talked to just now, or it could be binocular and accommodation issues and also ergonomic related problems because of poor posture. The children attend classes in varied ways. Some of them hold the device in their hands. A few of them use table and chair. Some of them lie down on their stomach and back and they attend these classes. That can lead to ergonomic related problems. And as already explained by the previous speakers, once they start attending school, they find a difficulty in sitting idle in the class. So the incidence of digital eye strain has been uh, reported to be from 26% uh, mild, 13% per, uh, moderate and 11% severe. And they have varied uh, symptoms like uh, worsening of eyesight, headache, increased sensitivity to light, seeing halos around objects, difficulty in focus on near targets, double vision, blurring of vision, dry eyes, heaviness in the eyelids, pain in the eyes, redness in eyes, excessive blinking, watering, tearing, foreign body sensation, itching and burning. So a wide spectrum of side effects of using the digital devices over four hours a day has been noted. So as already I had uh, told before, the normal blink rate is about 18 times per minute, but with screen usage, it reduces to around four times per minute. And that leads to aggravation of dry eye disease, which is very infrequent in children. But because of this excessive gadget use, we are seeing dry eyes now, even in children. So prevention is remember to blink, we have to adjust the lighting. Don't keep the screen too bright and the moisture conditions of the study room or workplace. If the classes are being attended to in a room with an air conditioner, that reduces the humidity further and we should not direct the blast of the air conditioner directly into the eye. So blue blocking spectacles or anti-reflective glasses can be used as deemed necessary and also treat the dry eye with medications that are the tear substitutes <clears throat> if necessary. So a group uh, screen schedule should be followed. That is, um, use it uh, as per uh, most of the times when the online classes, they give breaks in between. So these breaks are for getting up and moving around the house, taking a snack or just uh, not looking at the device for the 10 minutes of break. What usually happens is that even during the break time, the child uh, switches on to some other uh, gaming or uh, chatting with friends. So that should be avoided. And the 20-20-20 rule is something that all of us should know. That is, every 20 minutes, we are supposed to look at something which is 20 feet distance for 20 seconds. So if this is followed, that will greatly reduce the digital strain. The distance for digital devices usage is one foot uh, distance for the mobile uh, devices, two feet for the desktops and a uh, laptop and television at 10 feet. 
The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends a minimum distance of about an arm's length from the screen while using a computer. And also very important to note, two, two hours before sleep, we have to stop the use of digital device because the blue light can actually uh, uh, reduce the sleep uh, 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 immediately after uh, stopping the digital devices. The brain does not go into the NREM sleep immediately. So um, the proper posture is also very important as, as shown in the picture. The monitor should be at the eye level and the child should not be bending over to look into the screen. So coming to the binocular vision anomalies, so the binocular vision are non-strabismus binocular vision anomalies, which include fusion and vergence anomalies. So, uh, and also accommodation anomalies. So fusion uh, anomaly is convergence excess because continuously when you are looking at a device that leads to uh, excess activation of the medial rectus muscle that leads to convergence excess, which goes hand in hand with a divergence insufficiency. So when prolonged looking at a near device, suddenly when you look at a distance, the patient can have double vision and convergence insufficiency on the other hand can lead to headache watering and eye strain kind of symptoms accommodation excess because of constant looking at near devices can precipitate myopia or pseudomyopia accommodative insufficiency on the other hand can lead to blurred vision at near so all these are a host of binocular vision anomalies that we are seeing very frequently now Especially with convergence excess, we are even seeing convergence spasm leading to a near esodeviation or an inward deviation of the eyes. So uh, this is because the video display terminals induce more anomalies in accommodation and vergence compared to the ordinary hard copy or the non-VDT work. Because in susceptible individuals, the, those who have poor fusional divergence capacity, the excessive use of smartphone can lead to increased activation of the muscle, uh, the medial rectus, which uh, helps in uh, moving the eyes uh, towards, uh, that leads to convergent esotropia. Uh, or the inward deviation of the eyes leading to double vision. So uh, the, uh, usually this acquired acute committent esotropia is very rare. It is seen only as 0.3% of childhood strabismus. But in the COVID times, we have seen an increased number of children presenting with sudden onset of double vision and an inward deviation of the eyes. Um, there has been varied publications on this. And the criteria for diagnosis of this acquired uh, acute committent esotropia is initially it is intermittent and then it is constant, a large angle deviation. And the parents usually show photographic evidence of the absence of the uh, esodeviation before the said onset and normal motility. It's not a lateral rectus palsy and double vision. So these are the criteria for diagnosis. We do an imaging in all these cases because very rarely it can be associated with tumors of the cerebellum, brainstem, pituitary area and corpus callosum. And uh, such cases can also be associated with nystagmus or a shaky eyes. So uh, this was a study that we did in our clinic here when we had, uh, it was in the middle of the lockdown, around 18% uh, patients had presented, any of them had from Kerala and few from Tamil Nadu. But now we have around uh, 30 to 40 children who had presented with acute onset of double vision and esodeviation. So as you can see from this graph, many of them have presented within one or two months of onset and most of them within eight months of uh, onset of the double vision, which is very incapacitating because they are unable to do their uh, any activity. Double vision can uh, lead to inability to study, play and causes gross loss of coordination. Even ability to walk is uh, very much uh, less uh, because unless you close one eye, uh, you don't have coordination. So these patients, we had treated uh, many of them with injection botulinum toxin and uh, we had good results in around 80% which uh, and they had a cure and in few patients who had recurrence of the isotropia, we had to intervene surgically. So uh, this is the problem uh, that we have been seeing uh, recently and uh, this uh, shows the child who had presented with an acute onset of inward deviation of the eyes. You can see it's a committant deviation, large angle in all nine cases and this is post injection of botulinum toxin with straight eyes and he has got back his depth perception and stereopsis within a week to 10 days following injection. This is another patient 
who similarly presented she was an uh, older girl, high school girl again with acute uh, committed esotropia following injection of botulinum toxin she regained her binocularity and stereo vision but we do tell them that they should not go back to looking at the uh, smartphone devices um, uh, as before and uh, it is better if they can switch over to laptops or a desktop or tv uh, where the distance between the eye and the screen is more and also uh, use the Uh, 2020 20 rule and distance viewing and also we give exercises to increase their divergence amplitudes so coming to the the last thing that i would touch upon is myopia or near sightedness which has been a pandemic within a pandemic as even as it is even before lockdown the prevalence of myopia in the urban indian children has been gradually con- constantly increasing from around 5% in 1999 to 20% in 2019 that was before the onset of covid-19 so even based on the pre covid data the pre- uh, prevalence was supposed to increase to 50% in 2050 in southeast asia in singapore china and hong kong the prevalence of myopia is around 60 to 70% and we were fast approaching the rate but after the onset of covid we have seen a substantial myopic shift noted after home confinement due to coronavirus disease and the prevalence of myopia has increased around 1.5 to 3 times in 2020 as compared with the previous 5 years which is quite alarming why because uh, uh, why does myopia progress so fast in the lockdown due to prolonged near work increased digital screen time and insufficient time spent outdoors hence quarantine myopia is finding its place in debates and discussions uh, in the eye care world and this is especially important in younger children aged 6 to 8 during the formative years because they are the ones who may develop high myopia uh, as their eyes are very susceptible to damage excessive use of digital screens especially with the device held closer to the eye is more likely to induce myopic development the risks of high myopia so what if you get myopia it can be cured with eye glasses but that's not the case in high myopia you can get sight threatening complications like macular degeneration retinal detachment cataract and glaucoma which can cause irreversible blindness and hence we are looking at various interventions to try to uh, avoid the child from going into the high myopia range so the primary risk factor for myopia seems to be the distance between the eyes and the object is, which is being viewed so the kids have to keep a safe distance while using the digital devices always it's better to adopt alternative products like tv or projectors which have a relatively longer distance and limit the non school screen time which uh, is actually um, very important but also very difficult for parents to uh, make the child understand so the myopia control would include advice on environment that is a 2 hour rule outdoor time uh, after school should include 2 hours of play in sunlight the 20 20 20 rule which i have already told the elbow rule that is at least have a arm span uh, between your uh, eyes and a digital device optical treatments various spectacles newer types of spectacles made by various uh, eye care companies are being prescribed now which uh, claim to reduce the progression of myopia by around 60% various companies like the size hoya and uh, slr have come out with these glasses which are called the dims or the uh, halt glasses uh, and they are uh, structured in such a way that can uh, reduce the myopic progression and uh, they are little ex- expensive as compared to the traditional glasses but in patients who are able to afford and who have a strong family history and uh, with both parents uh, who are uh, myopic and the child already progressing it is a better uh, uh, alternative to the uh, normal glasses that we usually prescribe low dose atropine drops are also being used for the past couple of years for the control of uh, uh, myopia and that can give an additional benefit and also uh, binocular vision like if they have an esophoria and accommodative glass um, accommodative lag and they can also benefit by appropriate spectacles so interventions to reduce the myopia progression include the environmental considerations time spent outdoors so if you go out and play you can keep myopia at bay spectacles and contact lenses and pharmacological therapies including atropine so how does playing outdoors reduce myopia because it increases the re- level of retinal dopamine production that alters the gene expression and reduces the axial elongation so the problem with these eyes is that they elongate much rapidly and that leads to myopia so the dopamine is supposed to reduce this axial elongation 
Um, so these are the various uh, factors which have been described for uh, myopia control, lifestyle, uh, all go hand in hand. So once we advise atropine drops, we do advise environmental uh, lifestyle modifications also and uh, safe use of digital devices. So all the factors should be taken together, not in isolation. So the increased risk of onset, especially if there is parental myopia, East Asian ethnicity, refractive error progressing much more than what is normal for the age, excessive near work and limited outdoor time, then it's a sure shot way to uh, progress towards high myopia. An increased risk of progression, especially if the onset is nine years or less uh, with parental myopia and East Asian ethnicity. So low dose atropine, uh, which is 0.01 percentage can be used and it has been proven um, effective in reducing the progression by at least 30 to 40 percent if used regularly at night for at least a period of two years. Though there can be some non-responders, about five to 10 percent of the children are non-responders, but in many of them, as compared to what they would have progressed without the use of these low dose atropine, it does reduce the progression of myopia. The DIMS and the HALT technology spectacle lenses, which I have already explained. So um, in a nutshell, we should be worried about the ophthalmic outcome of COVID-19, not from the virus itself, but from the potential outcome of the antivirus measure on eye health, especially an outcome in children that may have major consequences for visual acuity later in life. So the, uh, we teach the children that they should, uh, the ways of using the digital devices, because that's going to be there. It is impossible for them to uh, not to use it at all, but they should know the way to use these devices in a uh, responsible manner in order to continue with their education. Mm -hmm. uh, the monitor cleaning, the distance adjustment, glare reduction, frequent blinking, mm -hmm. font scaling, um, use the glasses, proper lighting, all these are extremely important uh, things. And uh, with regards to school, we need to uh, give a recommendation that mandatory one hour of recess. Of playgrounds, the classroom should be constructed with more windows so they are well lit and they receive sufficient light. And also we should train the various stakeholders to increase the time outdoors for health apart from its role in countering myopia. So the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Ismail. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandra. I think uh, the practicing pediatricians would be really taking home a lot of newer things today. I myself learned a lot of newer things today, especially it is a very clarity in your talk. I think uh, most of them will be benefited. I think we can pass on the messages to all our parents regarding this 2020-20 rule and 1 to 10 and the elbow distance. Everything is new to us. And of course, it will be really benefiting all the children, especially in the myopia you have dealt elaborately about the treatment and the comprehensive factors involved in the treatment of myopia. It is really superb and a wonderful lecture. Hope there are some questions. I think I'll just check it up in the chat box. Oh, it's all appreciations. Thank you. <laughs> there are no questions and want of time. I think uh, we will move on to the next lecture. Dr. Sendhil, you can uh, introduce or uh, I'll go for yeah. the introduction. Yeah, I'll just... Uh, uh, next uh, topic will be Endocrine issues due to pandemic lockdown. This will be the icing on the cake by this program by IAP TNSC by a speaker for excellence. I would like to introduce him. Dr. Hemachand K. Prasad. He's a pediatric endocrinologist and a consultant in the Department of Pediatric Endocrinology, Meta Hospitals, Chennai. Consultant at Endo Kids Clinic, Chennai. So he has got various publications and he's uh, got many awards. And he's a wonderful speaker. Over to Dr. Hemchand Prasad for his talk. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you doctor, to the organizers for this nice invitation. But I'm very much surprised, sir, Prasad. I think you are more interested in growth charts. Very happy that uh, we are bored by, because my boss, Dr. Ramsamy, used to say to me, every other time, you need to have a road chat in your as a and you 
plot the growth curve and then talk to the parents. That is more important. He, he always advises me. And I'm happy to see that you are more interested in growth charts. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So I think over the next, I'm seeing the time and I'm just pruning the presentation as it goes. So I'll try to finish it very quickly, but let's hope we, if it is useful for the attendees. So to begin with, what is a pandemic? A pandemic is a biological disorder with a subsequent strong psychological and a medical impact. So I think the psychological impact is very beautifully dealt previously, a small aspect of the medical impact. So the theme of this next 15 minutes to find out what is the endocrine issue that is going to be on the rise in the days to come. Why is it going to happen? As a pediatrician, what should we do? And what are the red flag signs or the approach to this particular problem? So the first problem, which I think is definitely going to be on a rise is early puberty. This is a summary of data from various parts of the world who have looked into the prevalence of precocious puberty, early puberty, uh, both in girls and boys. And there is clear understanding that yes, there is a rise. So the first problem which a pediatrician is going to encounter on an increasing frequency in the days to come is precocious puberty. And what is the reason? It is not because of the direct efforts, uh, effect of the virus, but a result of the higher BMI, the higher usage of electronic devices, the higher psychological uh, factors of fear and anxiety, which is going to push the uh, activation of the HPG axis, increased levels of catecholamines, which is going to trigger the progress of puberty, higher exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals present in the household objects that is going to trigger the HPG axis, and altered sleep quality and sleep duration is going to just trigger the hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis. And this is probably the reason why as pediatricians, we are going to see a higher prevalence of precocious puberty and which probably all of us are already seeing as an epidemic. Our own data, which we published uh, a couple of years back and clearly the number is rising. So as uh, is very well known, any child with early maturation, the job of a pediatrician is to distinguish between the hair and the tortoise. Any child with breast budding less than eight years, early menarche less than nine years, testicular enlargement less than nine years is early maturation. So is it a normal variant like the tortoise or is it is a pathological state like the rabbit? The clues would come from a growth chart plotting, SMR assessment, bone age and ultrasound of the pelvis. So whenever you find that the child is growing very rapidly, like the child's growth on the right curve, where you can see the child's growth rate is growing very rapidly and shifting of centiles upwards, the growth velocity is very high and the child is very tall for the uh, population and for the family compared to the chart on the left side, where you can see that the child is growing normally for the population and for the family. Rapid rate of growth, a significantly advanced bone age, indicating a significant tempo of the, here, of the hormones going to lead to a compromise of the final height potential. And lastly, an ultrasound which shows an enlarged pelvic organs, uh, the uterine size and the ovarian volume, which is large for age, is going to support the diagnosis of early puberty. So the pediatrician, by basic approach, should be able to distinguish whether the child with maturation is a rabbit, indicating the child is going to lead to a compromised height and early menarche, this child would need evaluation or a tortoise where the child is going to grow slowly, progress slowly and attain menarche at the right age. So the red flag signs one should look for is high growth velocity, tall stature, bone age advancement and enlarged pelvic organs. Coming back to the table, the endocrine issue which one is going to see on a higher prevalence is precocious puberty. It is related to increased BMI, psychological issues, endocrine disruptors, screen time, sleep affection. As a pediatrician, Proper growth chart monitoring, as told by our uh, president, sir. Tanner staging, bone age, and ultrasound pelvis. The red flag signs are rapid growth, enlarged pelvic organs, and advanced bone age. The second problem, which I think we get, already all of us are seeing, is an uh, increasing prevalence of obesity. This is a summary of some of the studies described by the Western literature on the significant increase in the BMI in all children across the globe. Definitely there is a rise and there is a lot of interesting Indian data to tell us that the prevalence of obesity is rising 
the complications related to obesity is also on the rise. So it is something which we cannot ignore. There is enough Indian data to support this observation. How as a pediatrician, now we understood there is a problem. So what should we do to pick it up? Please follow the IAP growth monitoring guidelines. and Identify children who have a significantly elevated BMI above the 27th adult equivalent or the more than three standard deviations to pick up obesity early. The new BMI lookup tool, which obviates the need for calculation of BMI, is a new publication from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which can be used for children above eight years, plotting at the cross section of the weight and height and pick up children who are obese. So what is the reason for this? Of course, we know very well the restriction has reduced the physical activity options reduce the healthy food options, higher screen times, reduce sport activities, higher snacking, higher stress levels, higher anxiety. This is pushing normal weight children into obesity. Obesity in children into obesity with complications and obesity with early complications to obesity with established metabolic complications requiring pharmacotherapy. So we understood that obesity is on the rise and the reasons is very beautifully shown in this particular slide. So what should a pediatrician do? Remember the four pillars, diet, physical activity, screen time, and sleep. Work on the diet, work on the optimization of physical activity, stress the need for daily physical activity, try to improve work with the family and arranging and, uh, and tailor-made approach for the improvement of physical activity, reduction in screen time, follow the new IAP guidelines on screen time, and of course, improvement of duration as well as quality of sleep. Three important red flag signs which one should never miss are number one, an obese child, number one is waist. Please measure the waist circumference and plot it and interpret it in the perspective of the Indian waist circumference charts. If you find the waist circumference is above the 70th percentile, be careful, it may be a harbinger of a metabolic complication. Waist is a superior tool to pick up metabolic complications in an obese child. Second important tool or a red flag which is available for a pediatrician is the blood pressure. These are the new American Academy of Pediatrics blood pressure chart tables which have been published. And these are very, very, very simple screening tables. The rationale of using these tables is not to diagnose hypertension but to screen at a primary pediatrician level. They have been devised based on the 5th percentile height and the 90th percentile of blood pressure. So you never miss a child with hypertension. So this is like setting a very easy question paper, giving a very low pass mark and expecting a very high pass rate. These blood pressure tables are constructed from normal weight children and the cutoffs are very low. So you pick up hypertension early. So these tables must be used to identify children who are hypertensive. And the third important clue is to look for features of insulin resistance like acanthosis migricans and skin tags. Presence of these sort of red flag signs, elevated waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, and signs of insulin resistance should make one screen for complications. These are the guidelines on how uh, from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics for parents as well as practitioners to tackle obesity. This is our own publication on metabolic syndrome. So coming to the second important endocrine issue, obesity. Why is it going to occur? Because of increased screen time, reduced physical activity, changed dietary habits and stress. As a pediatrician, how should it be identified? Follow the Indian Academy of Pediatrics growth monitoring guidelines. BMI plotting will help. The novel BMI lookup tool can help one recognize elevated BMI and pick up obese children early. The red flag signs are three, hypertension, insulin resistance, elevated waist circumference that should complement the identification of obesity. Let's go on to the third endocrine issue, vitamin D deficiency. This is a new pandemic in the pandemic. There is data from across the globe about the increased prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in growing children. So definitely this is a rising trend. And what is the reason? We know very well, we get vitamin D from the sunlight, closure of schools, reduced physical training periods, results in a significant prevalence of vitamin D deficiency across the board. More time during lockdown uh, uh, has resulted in a better parental supervision. So the, the, the uh, replacement doses have to be fine-tuned for the particular aspect. 
Vitamin D deficiency results in impaired bone mass accrual, impaired bone mineralization because of vitamin D deficiency. So when do we test for vitamin D? The slightest suspicion test. It can be anything non-specific and the signs can be very varied. It is better to suspect it and not find it other than not suspect it and find it. And if you suspect it, a proper assessment of calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase and 25-hydroxy vitamin D should be done. In any symptom like a muscle pain, fatigue, motor delay, swollen ankles, etc. And common signs include rickets, plain, delayed closure of anterior pontinal hypocalcemia, etc. Suspect it, please test it. How do we tackle it? The fourth important question. There are new guidelines from the Indian Academy of Pediatrics in 2022 how this pandemic should be tackled. They have defined hypovitaminosis as any vitamin D level less than 12 nanograms per ml. Between 20 to 50, they say just ensure that the vitamin D RDA is received. If it is between 50 to 100, sunlight is adequate and more than 100 as per the previous norms, it considered as toxicity. So these are the new guidelines, how to approach and manage vitamin D deficiency. A simplified version of that is the same presented here. Less than six months, daily dose of 2000 IU, no cumulative doses along with calcium. Six months to one year, 2000 daily. If you are opting for a mega dose, it should be either 30,000 IU every 15 days for six doses or 60,000 IU monthly once for three doses. The doses are slightly lower. Above one year, it is 60,000 IU once in 15 days for five doses. I think the message is these guidelines have largely been written to prevent toxicity. Even though there is a pandemic of uh, vitamin D deficiency, the guidelines are written with the intention of preventing an epidemic of vitamin D intoxication, which they fear would follow. I think it is very well written guideline. The key things they have focused on is to increase the gap between two doses. Some previous one week, they've increased it to 15 days. Mega doses can be given only above six months and the maximum dose, total dose, which is recommended is 3 lakhs across the board. So if you give 60,000 every 15 days, five doses, that is like giving 3 lakhs cumulatively. This is the new treatment guidelines as per the Indian Academy of Pediatrics 2022. And they have very beautifully described the sunlight exposure guidelines for, for recommendation for our children. With exposure 15 to 40 percent of body surface area five times a week, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for about 30 minutes per day across the region, across the season, is recommended by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics for sunlight exposure. What is new in the guidelines? The minimum recommended dose has been brought down to 400. Fortnightly dose from a weekly dose, maximum calcium dose has been brought down to 500. Six doses have been brought down to five doses. Weekly doses from six months only and the two-week interval, they have given very beautiful recommendations on sunlight as well. So the new guidelines are grossly written to prevent toxicity. At the same time, bring up the child's vitamin D level to the optimum. So coming to the golden table, the next endocrine, I wouldn't say endocrine issue, the issue which uh, one would encounter is vitamin D deficiency. Why does it occur? Predominantly poor sunlight exposure. What should a pediatrician do? Suspect it early. Test. Calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, and 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And how should we approach the 2022 guidelines of giving the same doses, mega doses beyond six months, 15 days gap, and the first calcium never beyond 500 milligram per day. So the last endocrine issue, I wouldn't say an endocrine issue, it's becoming more and more a general pediatric issue with the epidemic of type 1 diabetes. Across the globe, probably, yes, the incidence is on the rise. The incidence is on the rise, not only pertaining to the uh, frequency, but also the severity and the age of onset. Is it related to the, uh, to the virus? Well, there is no clear answer for that, but definitely a lot of animal studies are, uh, are uh, 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 evolving to show that there is a, a, an affinity of the virus for the beta cells, and that has probably triggered this epidemic of diabetes. No clear answer yet, but yes, one is clear. The, the presentation is going to be more severe, more severe the DKA and the higher the HbA1c. So definitely uh, one is going to encounter more and more children with type 1 diabetes in the days to come. As a pediatrician, suspect it early, do a random check of sugar, 
urine routine and hba1c any child who wakens in the night to pass a lot of urine or drink water requiring more than one pamper per night increased bathroom usage from the school requiring lot of bottles of water to drink it must make a pediatrician suspect type 1 diabetes the basic blood test should be done in every new onset blood sugar hba1c ketone c peptide if access is there a venous blood test to rule out dka c peptide anti gad antibody to establish the type 1 diabetes nature and a comorbid condition hypothyroidism by doing a free t4 and a tsh how should one approach if your who criteria of diabetes are satisfied look for dka if dka is present manage as per dka protocol if dka is absent start directly on basal bolus insulin regimen so this is a, a mobile application that has been developed from our unit free for download from the app from the play from the play store which has been kept very simple easy and evidence based based on the ispad guidelines so this is a summary of the increased prevalence of endocrine abnormalities from our country as well as across the globe we 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 really realize that the four endocrine problems which are going to be on a rise in the days to come precocious puberty obesity and its complications type 1 diabetes and vitamin d deficiency why does precocious puberty occur it occurs because of increased bmi psychological issues endocrine disruptors uh, the altered screen time and sleep as a pediatrician what should we do growth chart tanner stage investigation wise bone age and ultrasound pelvis the red flag signs in a child with precocious puberty is high growth velocity and tall stature obesity <laughs> we know why it occurs because of higher screen time lack of physical activity changed dietary habits and stress again as a pediatrician pick it up early using following the iap growth monitoring guidelines the novel bmi lookup tool the three red flag signs are hypertension signs of insulin resistance like acanthosis nigricans and elevated waist circumference vitamin d deficiency clearly because of reduced sunlight exposure measure the bone mineral profile and treat as per the new iap 2022 guidelines type 1 dm dm definitely it's on the rise but the reasons are not very clear to us at the moment as a pediatrician suspect early don't miss dk start on basal bolus insulin at the earliest i think this is a small sum up of the common endocrine issues the rationale and relationship to the uh, to the lockdown as a pediatrician what should one do and how should one tackle at a primary care level thank you very much for your patience here uh, dr ismail yeah tell the oh yeah thank you hamshind i think you have uh, done a beautiful job i think four problems are taken in such a way and you have given four columns it's a ready recognition for all the pediatricians uh, identifying a problem in the endocrine in your own practice and actually what has he has to do a pediatrician has how to work up that such cases and what is the remedy he has to think and you have dealt in a, such a beautiful way i think the carry home message for all the pediatricians is very worthwhile i think i appreciate your way of narrating this lecture in such a way they will be embedded in all the minds of the pediatricians and they'll be happy to practice this endocrine problems thank you there are no more questions i'm very happy that the speakers at the faculties done today were in such a way there are uh, no question had come in the question box i think that shows the clarity in their thoughts uh, thank you and well, i got only, only one query to dr hemchan yeah. uh, dr hemchan you are there Yes, sir. Yeah. Why is it so difficult to treat this? Uh, I mean, childhood obesity or adolescent obesity. How how can we make it more practical for a pediatrician to approach this obesity problem? Why is it so difficult to treat them, to counsel them? Uh, see, I think uh, the uh, obesity as such. One thing is the acceptability of the parents. towards identification of obesity there is a lot of resistance there is a lot of uh, thinking that this is normal and uh, this is a growing age why should we identify and restrict their growing calories i think uh, uh, as a pediatrician uh, the growth chart remains the most uh, valuable tool in the hands of a pediatrician especially the new iap 2015 as well as the who modified iap charts uh, who charts modified by the iap has clearly put it in the in the perspective of uh, putting it as a red line 
to tell the parents that see your child is crossing the red line is crossing the red signal so please be careful about what the child is eating about the physical activity the child is spending about the screen time and about the quality of sleep i think these are the four pillars that i think one we would have to work with the family and even the novel uh, bmi lookup tool is also uh, consciously made uh, in the color coded fashion of identifying a yellow signal and a red signal yellow signal for overweight and a red signal for obesity so i think these are the tools that are available in our hand to plot it and show them that see this is the problem and you have to focus and try to bring it down back to the green line i think that would be the way forward in uh, tackling this new pandemic That's and thank you uh, yeah and and right. uh, i think yes yes please please and and uh, you rightly said the obesity no more remains a cosmetic problem it it it, it has evolved and into a, a big metabolic uh, uh, problem and the non communicable diseases per se the iap has a separate chapter for that it, it's it's going the right direction of identifying these problems early problems which we thought would never occur for example i never in my lifetime thought that i would see a child with type 2 diabetes and retinopathy these are things of the western world so this is a normal creation of god to give a normal child he never had to develop any disease overfeeding and obesity pushed this child into metabolic syndrome pushed this child into type 2 diabetes and pushed this child into retinopathy now and uh, this i think is is really a wake up call for all of us that the, the pattern of diseases emerging is very important that we identify children with obesity early and counsel them on lifestyle measures thank you uh, dr nachan yeah, yeah yeah one question and um, so i am seeing uh, four uh, problems uh, this pandemic uh, regarding endocrine issues one is uh, almost uh, 10 or 15 kg weight gain another thing is there are many uh, male children they are coming with uh, micro penis because of obesity yeah that one and another thing is a uh, gynecomastia that one the other thing and i think a few cases now increase of uh, slipped capital femoral epiphys also we are uh, seeing now uh, within 6 uh, months we have come across almost uh, three four children uh, so regarding micropenis and gynecomastia how do you counsel the parents uh, i think as far as uh, micropenis and gynecomastia is concerned i think all of us very well realize this is most likely related to be a, a probable a buried penis because right. of the uh, the the fat deposition in the pubic area and uh, lipomastia which is going to uh, uh, to present a pseudo gynecomastia and cause lot of anxiety and uh, stress to the family members i think the focus should be on weight loss if there is lot of anxiety probably measurement of the penile length after pushing the pubic pad of fat and plotting the penile length on the uh, penile charts and showing them see these are the penile length charts and your child's uh, penis is normal would give them lot of free children and uh, probably doing a simple ultrasound chest and showing that it's just fat, fat deposition radiologically tells them that this is not uh, glandular tissue you have only fat deposition here would probably give a sense of uh, reassurance to the family these are uh, a simple ways of tackling these two problem to to, uh, to you know reinforce the fact that only lifestyle measures remains the only solution okay yeah thank you sir and thank uh, you. i think uh, i asked dr tangvelu to summarize Uh, only one thing i would like to add here because as a, as an organization iap tnsc has to take forward all these post covid problems uh, to the stakeholders like the government services has to take the private practitioners have to reach the schools actually they have to reach the schools with all these uh, issues and highlight it to them teachers and parents and of course this has to be taken only then we will be able to do something to the community thank you i think there's two for rajendra i think yeah uh, sir dr tangavel sir yeah uh, it is uh, really nice that see each one of us faced a single problem now only we see there is a multi dimensional problem endocrine issues psychological issues high problem we didn't realize that so much of high problems have been uh, encountered during these days neurological problems and school issues it's something new for us because we are not sitting in the school to look at his children so it is a good learning point for all of us not only for the practice but even those in the institution also we come to know about the multi dimensional problems caused by lockdown issues thank you thank you all the faculty coach rajendran for summing up and closing yeah. so uh, on behalf of iaptnsi i really thank uh, today's um, 
a wonderful presentation uh, with the various aspect of uh, presentation school issues, ophthalmic issues, endocrine, and as well as uh, uh, various uh, presentations. And I, I thank uh, Dr. Tangvelisa to take um, uh, the uh, painting effort to organize this wonderful, uh, uh, what's needed for the hour is a very important thing. And I think he has done excellent work. And on behalf of IAP TNC, I thank uh, Dr. Tangvel sir, and we are doing this uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation today also, everybody. And I thank... Uh, the, uh, thanks uh, to the chat persons. Yeah, I, I thank... Uh, they, yeah, I want to tell... Uh, the yeah, they, uh, they remain uh, very alert. Uh, yeah. to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ismail <laughs> sir and uh, Aram sir. <laughs> sir, both they are um, really... Um, uh, uh, actually, uh, the, the chat person role, they done very well. And they are interacted very well also. And um, I thank all the obvious parents as well as uh, uh, people that are faculties as well as delegates who have attended. And uh, once again, I thank one and all. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank Wonderful you. program. Very well done. Thank you, sir. Sir, and the parents program on the third poll, sir. Sir, Panila, sir. I will do. I will IAP. Yeah. We will try to reach them, sir. Okay, we'll do it, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Sir. Thanks.